notes. Hello and welcome to another edition of our Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho. Joining me on set live is Shaka Sali himself. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? I am usually terrific, but uh, I must add, frankly, that uh, I am very, very delighted, if not hugely delighted, that you look even more this time more exquisite to the extent that I think you are ready to gather wings and actually take off in terms of fashion. Sir, I will take that as a compliment. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. A warm welcome to you all our Facebook followers are watching us alive. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka and ask him some uh, pertinent uh, questions about uh, the politics on the continent. And today maybe uh, we'll start off uh, in uh, France. Uh, uh, let's maybe start by expressing our our solidarity with uh, the people of France uh, who are, uh, are still in shock after a uh, fire, uh, I think, uh, gutted uh, one of the most iconic uh, uh, cathedrals uh, in Paris. Uh, if you've flown through Paris or if you've been in France, uh, you can't miss that. Uh, your reaction, Shaka? It is, of course, uh, in the heartland uh, of, uh, of Paris, the beauty of uh, uh, art, the beauty of love, uh, the beauty of lights. And uh, it is an incredibly uh, historical, iconic landmark, uh, which was built uh, in uh, the 12th century, really. And you can't believe it. Uh, some sources say that uh, it took the next 200 years, and others say 300 years to complete. Uh a lot of uh, money has been uh, flowing in in terms of euros, or you can uh, put it in uh, dollars. Uh, money has been flowing in from all corners. Uh, people are pledging uh, to rebuild that. Uh, a while ago, uh, President uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, I think, uh, and the, the Pope and the Catholic Church have vowed to uh, rebuild. Uh, what does it take to restore such uh, an iconic uh, piece of infrastructure? Well, it takes goodwill and uh, it takes patriotism. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is no shortage of that because earlier, you know, uh, in the day before I came here to work, there are two uh, of the richest uh, uh, individuals in France. Between them, they had already pledged about 300 million euros. The number has actually gone up. It's all over 700 um, million euros right Yeah, now. these were only two individuals who happened to be French. And uh, mind you, when you talk about uh, the Notre Dame, the iconic landmark that is the most visited landmark in Paris, perhaps in fact in France, yearly you are talking about 13 million human beings. That's incredible. million human beings. And on a given day, you are looking at 30,000 people. If you put it in the context, by the way, the country where you and I come from, the Republic of Uganda, about how many tourists does it actually receive each year? Uh, how about uh, critics uh, who are saying that uh, perhaps uh, uh, it took too long uh, for the firefighters uh, to respond uh, uh, in situations like that, uh, uh, in most cases, uh, in the developed world, quote-unquote, uh, they say firefighters or responders are usually there in minutes. But uh, we saw this thing just burn, burn, burn to ashes, and the firefighters were just there. Uh, it took them time to respond to the fire. To be very uh, honest with you, I don't really want to attempt even to go there because uh, I still need some information. I need to be able to make a judgment based on information. And so far, I do not have that type of information in order for me to comfortably really weigh in. But what I can say is that uh, this is not only a loss of the people of Paris, nor is it a loss only of the people of France. It's a loss, in a sense, of the Catholic world. And in fact, 
the Christian world, and even beyond Christianity, everybody pretty much, uh, you know, can't believe what actually happened there. And I think that uh, the French president uh, rightly said that he was saddened, like most of his compatriots, uh, to see the Notre Dame actually burn, because when it burns, it's like part of you, or all of us, in fact, are burning. Uh, in terms of uh, symbolism, uh, what does that uh, symbolize? What does that uh, iconic uh, cathedral symbolize? It means different things to different people, but what we, can, what we know historically, for example, is that uh, in 1804, a great military general, some would consider, in fact, to be a great military genius, yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte, a man, of course, who became the emperor of France, in 1804, he was actually crowned in that particular cathedral by a pope in that particular cathedral. And uh, a great historical lady, uh, Joan the Ark, Joan the Ark, uh, uh, the lady, the peasant lady, very courageous uh, and very patriotic in as far as France was concerned actually led the French in several battles against the English. And uh, she actually, in 1909, if I remember my history correctly, mm. she was beautified, beautified in that particular church. It's uh, a great place. Uh, let's uh, now cross over to politics. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about our uh, politics. Uh, we have uh, stuff happening on the continent. Uh, uh, last week, you correctly uh, said, if I remember correctly, you said that uh, it was just a matter of time uh, before uh, a, a soldier, uh, a general, or anybody within, uh, within cross proximity to the State House uh, uh, to develop an appetite uh, and take over the government, and uh, it happened right after we left the show. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, what, what, are, uh, what are your immediate uh, reactions since uh, the coup happened? I'm glad that uh, what we talked about uh, or we predicted uh, happened, and it had to happen. It's not that uh, we were the one, in fact, making it happen. Remember that you and I really are messengers, and we are messengers on the basis of the messages that we interact with. And so we were looking, for example, at the social, economic, political conditions that obtain on the ground in Khartoum and beyond. And so what we are looking at, in fact, in Khartoum, it's not limited to Khartoum, nor is it limited to the Republic of Sudan. It is something that could spill over all over the continent or the world in terms of if, for example, you have these changing demographics, mm in tandem with social media, which allows them to have remarkable opportunities of exposure, to know exactly what is happening within their neighborhood and beyond. And also, if in fact the economies of those societies are stupid, if these guys can't get jobs, if these guys can't get jobs, they can't get an opportunity to put food on the table, if they don't feel like they have hope, mm. what, is there, what else is there left for them? It is change. Change is the only constant. And no society, no dictator should deceive themselves, by the way, that for some strange reason, even if they have some kind of divine rights, just like the ancient European kings or kings, in fact, globally, who basically believed and in fact ruled by the fact that uh, they had a sort of divine right precisely because, by the way, Paul, majority of the people under them were, in terms of information, very much challenged. They were ignorant. They didn't know what That's was correct. going on around that time, nor did they even know the relationship between them and that thing called the state or the government. Uh, interesting. Uh, let's go to a comment. Let's go to Damasia Satetro. 
what does the current uh, political trend in northern Sudan uh, mean to the rest of Africa? Uh, you can also maybe add Algeria. What do those uh, uh, events mean to the rest of uh, Africa? I think uh, what do they mean is pretty much the same thing that uh, I have just been talking about. I am talking about, for example, the changing demographics. One of these days, uh, you'll wake up and you'll find that uh, the young people form the majority of the people across the continent. Mm. And this changing demographic, this potentially politically powerful group of people, if they can mobilize and organize themselves, mm. they are not invested in the status quo. They are not invested in the economy. They have no jobs. They have no future. Their future, of course, is ahead of them. They are more knowledgeable. They have access to information so much that they are exposed to know what is going on here and there. And they also know that the people that are leading them, their future is behind them. They do not have solutions, because if they had solutions, they would have created an environment that would have created not only hope, but also would have created jobs so that these young people could actually go to work and have the ability to get what is needed in order for them, for example, to bring food and put it on the table. Those things don't happen. If those things don't happen, and given that society is dynamic, it is not static at all, these old people who are in power, wherever they are on the continent, or in the world for that matter, they need to fig begin figuring out seriously and paying attention to making arrangements in terms of their exit, managing their exit strategy. Mm. Because if they don't manage their exit strategy, unfortunately, that particular exit strategy could actually be arranged by some other forces which may not necessarily be environmentally or even politically friendly. Uh, let's go to another comment. Uh, let's go to uh, Delta Kilo. Uh, given that uh, Bashir is gone, uh, shouldn't uh, the Sudanese uh, stop uh, the protests? Uh, uh, as we speak now, uh, the protests have been defiant. They have said, you know what, we are not going anywhere until our demands are met. How would you respond to Delta? I think that... Uh, the protesters really have a point because, let's face it, uh, we're looking at change. They really want change. And this change is supposed to be reflected through what they hope is what they are part of, a revolution. They were not looking for the change of guards. Mm -hmm. They were not looking for a Paris coup. They are looking for situations which can help them change the obtaining social, economic, political conditions on the ground so that they can probably even become a society that is more transparent, more open, more, in a sense, a society that is democratically friendly. Democracy meaning they can actually have choice and have the opportunity, for example, to know and actually exercise the right to own an opinion that may not necessarily be in tandem or be on the same page with the ruling system, the ruling party, or the ruling soldiers, or the government for that matter. And in fact, it is very, very important for Africa to begin seriously looking at the fact that you don't make decisions without consultations. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you really work on behalf of the primary stakeholders. And the stakeholders are the people. Those people donate power to you. That power does not belong to you. You exercise it on their behalf. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, exercising power on uh, their behalf, uh, on the people's behalf, uh, let's go to another comment from uh, James Roberts. Uh, using the situation uh, in uh, Sudan, for example, uh, there are other dictators. Uh, he talks about uh, uh, Uganda, talks about Rwanda, talks about Cameroon, and uh, uh, the dictator of all dictators uh, in Equatorial Guinea. 
uh, what lessons should these uh, people uh, take away from uh, uh, the current situation in Sudan and Algeria? Theodore Obiang should be counting his days. The time when there are leaders really who hoodwink people on the continent is gone. For example, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, I remember at one time, giving the highest, the highest nations award to the president of Equatorial Guinea, Theodore Biang Basongo, who at that time happened to be, by the way, the chairman of the African Union. I should add Paul Kagame, too, received the same award. Yes. Now, in this particular case, uh, what I really am talking about, uh, the, word, the award given to Theodore Biang sincerely, if I remember correctly, the Ugandan president was quoted as, in fact, giving him this award for, in his words, not mine, promoting African democracy. Now, the last time I checked, uh, you know that uh, they have elections every so many years uh, in Marabo, in Equatorial Guinea, where Theodore Biang uh, gets in the neighborhood of uh, the upper 90s in terms of percentage. And when you go to the national parliament, uh, the last time I checked, there was only one individual who happened to be operating within the National Assembly. Okay. That is not a democracy. Uh, let's go to uh, the Africa Union. Uh, reacted and uh, they have actually threatened to suspend uh, Sudan uh, if they don't transfer power within uh, 15 days. Uh, any possibility that this actual threat could actually uh, maybe result into some, something tangible that uh, the people of Sudan can hold and say, hey, uh, we at least fought for this? I think that um, at least the African Union has been um, courageous uh, enough uh, to be able to speak out. They may not necessarily have the means that can actually, uh, for example, uh, enforce whatever they are talking about. But I think symbolically it is very, very significant. You know, they also, by the way, have done that before. They actually did it to Egypt. Mm. Even at a time when the United States itself, for some strange reason, was actually saying that there was no coup in Cairo, the African Union, at least at that time, was courageous enough to come out openly and said, no, this was a coup, and it should be seen for what it is, even though, of course, later, uh, nothing much really changed. But you know what? I think it is very important for our audience to learn that the African Union and the international community, for example, no longer, no longer tolerate military coups. If a general, a colonel, a major, mm. or even uh, a, a, a corporal like Ford de Sanko at one time in Sierra Leone was a corporal and yet uh, he had such enormous power, if you shoot your way, downtown and you seize power, the African Union and the international community are not going to do business as usual with you. I wish they could, in fact, also extend that, for example, to making sure that when a country actually holds an election, it is going to be an election that is credible, that is transparent, that is verifiable that is going to be an election and not a selection, an election whose results are, in fact, going to reflect the will of the people, not mm -hmm. the will of the individual that announces the fake results, or not the will of the individuals who have actually been chosen by a dictator to form the electoral commission, so that, in fact, it is not about the will of the people who are counting the votes on behalf of the incumbent president, that they should in fact say, we are not going to do business as usual, as usual with that type of arrangement. And I think they should also in fact even go ahead and say, 
countries or the presidents who are in power, mm. since, in fact, before they go to state house, they are sworn in. And guess what? When they are sworn in, they actually agree to defend and protect the Constitution. That, in fact, these very individuals should not be allowed, under any circumstances, to change these constitutions so that they can actually hang on to power. That if they do that, the African Union and the international community should simply say, we are not going to do business as usual with you, because in some way, shape, or form, that is, in fact, a coup. How about uh, our critics? Let's first go to a comment from uh, King Donga Theodore. Uh, he says, uh, do you believe he, uh, that the African Union represents people? Perhaps I can add that uh, there are people who argue that uh, African Union as an institution is the most hypocritical institution of all time. Why? Because they prop these leaders. Most of the leaders who have been at the helm of that institution are the same leaders that we are talking about who have been disposed by their own people. Are your thoughts? Well, in fairness to the African Union, and I'm one of those uh, uh, critics, actually, who often say that uh, you're looking at an institution that has teeth that do not bite. And part of the reason, frankly, is because you have to look at its structure. You have to look at how it came into existence. You also have to look at the kind of powers that it does have or does not have. The African Union is not, for example, an institution that has sovereign powers, like the European Union, for example. Mm. The European Union can do all sorts of things. And in order to qualify to be a member of the European Union, by the way, you must at least be able to meet some kind of democratic threshold. Whereas, on the other hand, when it comes to the African Union membership, all we have to do is to be an independent country. Once you are an independent country, it does not matter whether you are democratic, whether you are democratically challenged, whether you are a dictatorship, or whether you are whatever you are. So the thing is, we should not necessarily blame the African institution on the basis frankly, of what it is or it is not. Because, let's face it, there is a saying that under those types of circumstances, you have to agree to go to war with the army that you have rather than the army that we you wish, wish you had. Okay, let's, the interesting thought. Uh, let's go to another take here. Uh, let's go to Barbara Heather. Uh, what, is the youth, what is the use of uh, the African Union when they are silent on all the things that are happening on the continent, uh, for example, look at the floods in Zimbabwe, look at the xenophobia attacks in South Africa. They are silent, but they are quick to react to uh, uh, unthreatened South Sudanese people that if they don't transfer power, they will suspend them. Again, yeah, Barbara has a very legitimate point. There's no question about it. But again, as I explained a little bit earlier, you have to look at the structure. You have to look at the characteristic of the African Union. You have to look at the institution, the kinds of powers that it has and the kind of powers that it does not have. You know as well as I do that uh, its uh, predecessor, the OAU, the Organization of the African Union, it was also came, I mean, it also came under enormous criticism. But the only difference between that earlier institution and this one is that, one, the OAU had the mandate, for example, of decolonizing the entire African continent from European colonialism and also ending the South African-based apartheid. And in fairness to the institution, it accomplished those two important things. Where it may not have done well, uh, it is largely because, frankly, mm. it did not have the mandate. Now, when, to look, when you look at uh, the African Union, uh, unfortunately, it has yet to prove to us that it can really make a difference in the 
life of the average African. We also have to look at uh, uh, really what, for example, the goal of the African, the organization, uh, I mean, what in fact sometimes uh, uh, how the OAU operated. It was not allowed, for example, to interfere in the internal affairs of member countries, no matter whether a dictator was killing people, whether a dictator was hanging people, throttling them, and what have you, it was agreed that you cannot touch a member country as long as it is characterized as quote unquote domestic or internal Has problems. that changed? Yes, it has changed, in, in at least way? on paper, in the sense that uh, right now the African Union does not have this business to deal with about not interfering in the, in the internal affairs of a member country. In fact, it has a mandate that allows it not to be indifferent. So at least in terms of on, the, on paper, in terms of theory, it has the opportunity to make the difference. So yes, I think it is high time, for example, that in fact it should be able to go beyond simply talking the talk so that it can in fact walk that particular talk so that Africans can actually begin to walk the walk. Uh, what lessons can be learned from uh, 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 what's happening in uh, Northern Africa right now, uh, in Algeria, in uh, Sudan? What, could, what lessons can we draw from there, especially for young people? Very simple. That, uh, for example, that as long as you have these emerging, uh, changing demographics, and you cannot create conditions, frankly, that allow them, for example, to have a life, allow them, for example, to get jobs so that they can put food on the table, to allow them to exercise their inalienable rights, their birthright of freedom, for example. They, they, as long as you cannot do that, they are going to have to do it because they have the power in the sense that they are the majority, they are more informed than previous generations. Luckily, they have uh, uh, the friendly social media, which exposes them uh, much more than, for example, in the case of those of us who I said were beneficiaries at one time of uh, the Gutenberg factor. The, pr the printing press. The printing press, because the printing press, mind you, Paul, was also not democratic you had the first and foremost to get the opportunity to learn mm. how to be able to read so that then you could actually form an opinion. But in this particular case, you can simply look at the pictures and the pictures happen to reflect what is called a universal language. Uh, what are you talking about tomorrow on Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow we are basically taking you, the audience, to the Sudanese capital, Khartoum and find out what is happening and not happening. Uh, very briefly, when are you going to talk about xenophobia attacks in uh, South Africa? That's a comment coming in. We'll pretty much uh, talk about that. Uh, you know, we have the unfortunate uh, disadvantage of being a platform or a program that goes out only once a week, each Wednesday. So. Sometimes we react to what is going on, and sometimes we take a bit of initiative. But we promise you that one of these days we're going to be talking about that. Because let's face it, we need to forget what happened in Berlin, in the German Shaka. capital 1884, and say Africa. Unfortunately, uh, that's the time we have for, for the show today. We look forward to another edition of Shark Extra Time. Until then, uh, so long from Washington. Thank you, sir. You're most welcome.